ذاتي من هذه وصحبه الفضل شلونكم ان شاء الله؟ شلونك؟ ان شاء الله خليك كذا نحن نحكي بايه؟ بلغه الافلام انا اما انتم انتم اهل الخليج فمرحبا بكم ان شاء الله الى مدينه نيويورك ونسال الله سوري Welcome to New York. It's great to have you here. And whatever you want to do, just do it. So, how many of you are here from the UAE? Ajitun bil kapsa? Saudi. Malaysia. Biryani nukum afdal min biryani fil Hind. I had a friend from the Emirates. He spoke Hindi better than Indians. So I asked him. يعني كيف تعلمت هذه اللغة قال عشان أفلام because of movies he learned Hindi شاروخانة so feel free to ask any questions I'll just give a little background my name is William Sohib Web I became Muslim in 1992 أو تسعمية وتسعين أسنان فضيلة أنتم تحكمون بالإنجليزية يعني على الطلاق صح ماشي وأنا شوفت المصريين هنا تمت I don't know. I smell kosher. So, do you know what is kosher from the Khadij? Uh, that's why I'm big now. You're kosher. So, uh, I was, I'm from Oklahoma. I don't know if you know where is Oklahoma. I doubt you visited Oklahoma on your trip to famous historic and touristy places. I'm sure Oklahoma wasn't in the top, you know, maybe 300,000. But uh, if you saw the movie Twister, that's like Oklahoma. Or maybe The Wizard of Oz, it's kind of like Oklahoma. Oklahoma is the most important part of Oklahoma. The Sahara, the Nujum, and I became Muslim when I was 20, my freshman year in college. I was about to pledge a fraternity called Alpha Phi Alpha, which is an Af African American fraternity, which I still might pledge now. They're asking me even to pledge now, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but I'm not going to go through all that stuff. I'll just write in. And uh, instead of doing that, I found a copy of the Quran at the age of 17. I, uh, probably in the late 80s, um, I was a hip hop DJ. Uh, and in the late 80s, hip hop was very different than it is now. It was much more hip than it was hot. And um, I would say that my first real exposure to Islam was through music, um, through someone called Rakim. Maybe some of you here from. From, from, from Queens and other places, you know, some of these characters. And uh, they talked about Islam, I didn't know what Islam was. A freshman in high school, I actually did a book report on Malcolm X before the movie came out because I thought the name was like a cool DJ name. So I was like, DJ Malcolm X about to get wrecked, break some necks, you know, cash and checks. So I, I liked the name, and that's how she, I just read the book. And then when I read the book, I was, of course, captivated. It's a very profound story, very profound. I was only 14. So then I knew at 14 there was a difference between like pseudo-Muslim cults and Islam. Then at 17, um, I was DJing for people who claimed to be Muslims, uh, Nation of Islam and, and the 5% Nation and other kind of pseudo-Islamic sects, but maybe similar to some Islamic sects you find in the Muslim world. Uh, and then at the age of 20, I became Muslim by reading the Quran. Uh, when I became Muslim, of course, in Oklahoma, <laughs> you know, white guy, I become Muslim. Um, you know, it was surreal. My parents were initially quite frightened. Um, they thought, I mean, my mother asked me if I was going to kill them in their sleep um, on more than one occasion, seriously. So I expressed to her, like, are you deen and yet more shakhs be had? And then initially, over time, uh, I had a teacher from Senegal, West Africa, who taught me, I memorized Quran with him, alhamdulillah, and some mutun, these classic Arabic books. Um, and he was a very, very inspirational figure, very progressive, very enlightened person, spoke French, English, um, was very gifted. Um, and then it went, encouraged me actually to go back to school, because when I became Muslim, people were telling me, how could you go to the Kafir University, you know, Kaifa Tadusada, Aidil Kufar, Shafi, Ukanda. So I, uh, sorry, so I, uh, he actually told me, you have to go back to school, and you have to do well, and that's a way to reach your parents. Because my father's a PhD in history, so. He's not going to settle for his son being anything but a, a doctor. So I uh, went back to school, did very well before they died, and then I saw my father and mother actually started to open up. They did not become Muslim, uh, but they were very accepted of Islam. My mother, she like has all the lingo, like inshallah, alhamdulillah, Allah akbar. You know, sometimes she says it the wrong place. You know, something good happens, she's like, I will do good, I might know that's alhamdulillah. 
but it was a good experience. And, and for the most part, um, I mean, there's definitely a struggle when you become Muslim as a white American. I think in America there's a certain struggle because I don't think the white community is conditioned to Islam in the way that the African American community is. Um, and then, and then, you know, dealing with my friends. But alhamdulillah, Allah made it easy, and the, you know, I found it, it was very enjoyable. Um, in many ways, I was able to practice aspects of Islam in America that I was never able to practice until recently in Egypt. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Um, and I'm being honest about that. Then I married, my wife is Malaysian, I have a very interesting family, and my brother-in-law is Palestinian. So we have like a huge family reunion of like Malaysians, white people from Oklahoma, and Palestinians from Gaza. So we have like our family reunion shirt, it's like, we don't, the shirt's not big enough for all the names. But Alhamdulillah, it's been a good experience, and I'm glad that you came. Allah says, Li ta'arafu, in the Quran, wa yani, la buda na ta'araf wa na ta'araf. And it's important that the Quran says we should get to know each other. I think Muslims made a profound mistake after 9-11 when they told non-Muslims, you need to learn about Islam. No, we need to learn about each other. And that's in the Quran. So, if you have any questions, if not, marhaban bikum, wa bikum. I think there's some brothers here too. And may Allah bless you to be students of knowledge and to use your knowledge to benefit people. Knowledge is something very important. وَلَمْ يَأْمُرُ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى حَبِيبًا عَلَيْهِ سَلَامٌ أن يسأل في زيادة إذا في العلم وقل رب زيني علما وعلم هنا نكر اللي عشان يفيد التنوع كل علم له علم. so I have to speak a little Arabic for him and may Allah bless your studies. you are young women also you have a major role to play. half of the ship is women so if half of the ship's crew is gone the boat is not going to go anywhere and it's just a reality. We're not going to be able to sail. We'll, we'll, we'll sail one way like this, but we'll just end up making the circle. So we have to have both sides of the ship in order to move forward. And some of the great scholars of Islam were women. Historically, up until the 10th century, before there were a number of things that happened to us which affected us socially. So can you imagine sisters in the 10th century after Hijrah, the greatest scholar of Sahih Bukhari was a woman. This is 200 years after even Hajr, Masri. So, she was living in Afghanistan of all places, in Herat, and the scholars called her Fatima of Herat. She had the highest a'la sanad ila Rasulillah fi Sahih Bukhari. So people used to travel to her to study hadith from her. So you find in the Asani, of especially the Kutub al-Sitta, and especially Bukhari al-Sharif, you find this woman, Fatima of Yamat. She was the greatest scholar of her day in Bukhari. So people used to go there. So now you are in this, mashallah, this sunnah of the Salaf to travel for knowledge. One of the shuruta of the ilm is al-Rihla. And hatta majma' al-Bahrainiya aw amdiya huquba. So may Allah yanfa'akum bi ilmikum. وأن يجعله حجة لكم ولا عليكم إن شاء الله. so if you have any questions, if not, Islam in America is an incredible experience. it's very bright, vibrant. we have our problems. we have to deal with some of the more extreme conservative parties. but just like the Egyptian people told me when I left, bad things bring out the best qualities in people. right. so, um, but by and large, my experience with American people has been very good. Uh, after 9-11, a woman called our mosque in Oklahoma, a very, very beloved neighbor of the mosque. She was a non-Muslim general mosque in Bata'ana, Mushfi Shibra, in America. So she called us and she said, I have a son. He's very, very versed in the art of using a shotgun. So I was like, man, this is 9-12-01. So I was like, this is the last thing I need to be recorded on the phone. Some lady with a shotgun and her son. And then she said, I... I know your community, I watch your community, I watch what you do with young people, I have a profound respect for you. So I'm volunteering my son to come as a guard for the mosque with his gun and he will protect your community from anyone that tries to harm you. This is a non-Muslim woman. So I told her, you know, we really appreciate your son and his gun, but uh, I have to kindly uh, you know, yield it to the board of the masjid. That's what imams always do. Um, there was a, a night, the night of 9-11, I looked outside the window and I saw a lady and it looked like something was on fire, so I got scared, I said, oh God, you know, she's going to burn down the masjid. Get in close, no fatal attraction, you burn down the masjid. 
I went outside and actually it was flowers with this really nice shiny paper. And she was crying and she's like, I feel sorry for how people are treating your community. There were people who called us, there were people who drove by, honked their horns, there were bad experiences, but honestly I would say the good far outweighed the bad. American people are very proud people, we, we love liberty, we cherish uh, virtue for the most part, and the virtue of being free and being pluralistic is something very endeared in our hard drives as Americans. So we actually were able to develop a number of important relationships and friendships with people. So I'll let you ask your questions, if not, then I'm going to them. Well, well, sometimes this is a very good question she's asking about as a white, I mentioned as a white American, maybe sometimes you face different obstacles than, say, for example, African American community does. And, and what I meant by that is that if you look historically, Islam has been a key component in the African American community for more than maybe 120 years. Uh, Al Sharpton, when Tavis Smiley, after, I think it was right after 9 11, he had this big conference on the black church. And he said, Tavis Smiley was a very important, very profound important commentator in America, African American, very intelligent person, I really like him. Um, he said that, you know, how can we get the Muslims here? You know, how, how can we get the Muslims to be part of the black church? So Reverend Al Sharpton, who is your neighbor, mashallah, uh, Reverend Al Sharpton actually responded and said very, very, very emotionally that everyone in this audience, all African Americans basically, has a cousin named Jamal, a cousin named Rashad, a cousin named Ruqayya, and an auntie named, you know, Amina. So he said, "What the problem is us? We didn't invite them. They're already part of the black community. They're already ingrained. You know, there's something ingrained in our psyche. I mean, African Americans, mashallah, have been key in the spread of Islam in America, and their community is a very old community and very organized community uh, in many, many areas in America. For example, in the Bay. So for white Americans, you don't have that. You don't have a long history of like a white Muslim presence in America. So when I became Muslim, I think the biggest problem wasn't necessarily the theological issues. I think sometimes we come." Convolute those things where we think, sorry, I'm very tired today, forgive me. I'm so jet lagging and I'm a bit fucking with my Saudi Muslim scene, so I have to change my operating system. But I think for a lot of us, when we convert, it's not so much the theological issues. A lot of times it's social problems that we bring. So I can't drink anymore. So, like the night before I became Muslim, I was smoking weed. Like, I was high as like a kite. Bongo, bongo, bata, bongo. So the next day, I became Muslim. And, you know, the sheikh was like, you know, you got to stop. And I was like, it's hard. He's like, do your best. So I humbly I stopped, right? But my friends, they didn't stop. So that's kind of the struggle that you face where, where your friends, I think even Muslims who, who try to be better Muslims and they might have bad friends have the same issues, right? So social problems more than actually religious issues. When you talk to non-Muslims and say, well, we believe in God, we believe in the prophets, then they're not going to have a problem with that. I mean, initially, when I, when I read the Quran, I, I didn't know what Muslims believed. So when I read, like, Abraham, Maryam, I was like, wow, I actually believe in a prophet. I didn't know that. I, I thought they believed Muhammad was God. So, so my, my struggle was more social issues. Uh, because I was a DJ, I was really in, in, in a deep kind of musical climate where I don't have a problem with music personally, but the, the environment was very bad, right? So my struggle was how to, number one, I couldn't change all my friends, right? So, so that was a struggle where I couldn't just leave all my friends. Then I, I wasn't doing what they did, so we have a lot of things in common. Uh, as young guys going to clubs, strip bars, smoking weed, I'm not going to keep going. Other stuff like that. Um, you know, I can't, like, after Juma, I go to the strip bar. And it's like, you know, in the Sayyidat Yudhibna, it hasn't had that. So, uh, my, my big struggle was that, was trying to find emotional support. People that could be astiqa. So I was blessed really when I became Muslim. Half of Karachi actually was at my university, I think. And, uh, really, really, really. That was before 9-11, of course. Um, really beloved Pakistani brothers kind of just took me in. And I remember like I was sitting in the mall, I was like wearing, remember cross colors? I was wearing like cross colors and like my pants were backwards, crisscross. 
You see what the dudes, they put milk in and they have hot, like I never saw hot tea before, like I'm not British, no offense. Oklahoma's like iced tea with lemon. So I was like, man, they actually like boiled tea and like put milk in it and it's like piles up over the stove and then it's like dude patty. <laughs> wow. And then I remember, and I don't mean this in a bad way, because these guys were fresh off the boat. They're not Americans, right? I was like, man, I'm like, I'm hanging out with a bunch of nerds. <laughs> like, well, I'm hanging out with a bunch of nerds. But then I said, you know what? Islam called me to look, and look at them as nerds. It's my brothers, right? So that was one. Secondly, was the Muslim community tends to be very, um, I'd say, kind of not in tune with like America at that time, especially. So we're just like, I had to leave football and play cricket. I had to give up, you know, like, I had to give up, like, Stallone from Shah Rukh Khan. I had to uh, change. I was a Democrat, now I'm part of the People's Party. It was, just, it was just a real, real, real difficult social move over. And I guess why a lot of converts, you find us, we, you find converts who don't even speak English anymore, man. They speak, like, a, a, a dialect English because they've become, they've adopted a different set of social constructs. And that's what I'm looking for. I had trouble finding social support in the community for being an American, in the sense of like never being exposed to Muslim cultures. And I didn't even have to marriage. Now we have people who want to turn the masjid into, you know, fried chicken, pot roast, uh, 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 biscuits and gravy throughout the biryani and the mashi. But I think I think we need to have all. And that's what Islam, Islam empowers us to not look at an immigrant, non-immigrant dichotomy but to look at a Muslim dichotomy, a human dichotomy, and then transcend it to other, human, other people, other faiths. So that, that was a struggle for me. That was hard, I was lonely. Till now sometimes I'm lonely. I, I don't have like the, the homies I can kick it with. Like I can go and watch Monday Night Football, and drink a non-alcoholic beer, and like boo Tom Brady, and the Jets. Okay? So, sorry, so, and the Giants too. So like, like those are things that I miss. Um, and then, but luckily when I became Muslim, a lot of the brothers, we were actually a part of a gang called the Bloods. A lot of us became Muslim at the same time. So we were able to have that support. But now I live in San Francisco, no offense to anyone on the West Coast, I don't really have that convert kind of click that I had. So socially, I'd say it's more difficult socially with your family and your friends, and even within the community itself, to feel this kind of a sense of who you are. So you go to America and you'll be shocked. The one who's wearing the most Eastern dress are not the people from the East. It's the people from here. Because they are trying to anchor some type of identity and self worth. So that, that was a struggle that I had. Yes. Wanti min fein? Ahmo sahi mohab. Fein al fein al al il betaum il mansa. Aywa. Wa maqluba. Ahmo sahi mohab. I'm asking about their dishes. <laughs> As you can see, I'm very versed in cuisine. I was skinny when I became Muslim too. That's another problem. <laughs> My wife gets upset. It's your fault. Muslim people inviting people over. Oh, welcome, Imam. We hope Allah tawala wa amrak. Yeah. And they give you the worst food in the world to eat. Your arteries clog up in like an hour. I said, I have a protein bar. No, no, haram alaykum. <laughs> I had a student, I used to teach Islamic school, named Hanin. MashaAllah. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um. <laughs> Most of these, you know. I mean, here dawah is different because there's a lot of freedom, no offense. There's a lot of hurriya, right? So the way to give dawah, you can get like, we say you get funky with it. You know, you, you can really do things with dawah. So for example, in Oklahoma, there was this brother, he was a, he had a liquor store. Can you give him a So, we do out of So, we're like the American convert, we call ourselves like the convert posse. We're like, how can we make dawah to this dude, man? And he, he was selling like pornographic magazines and beer and, you know, it's like, we just tell him, bro, you know, you're, I, I, my degree actually is in education. So cognitive disorders, a lot of that has to do with alcohol and drugs and the family. 
that has a very, very devastating effect, especially if the husband or the, the, the mother is an alcoholic. So we decided, I was the imam of the masjid, I was the khatib student, my student days, I was a little bit more wilder, hope none of those recordings came out, and Fox knew that one. So I, uh, his brother, he was, my friend, he used to DJ, Moshe al We used to be DJs, he's my best friend, and DJ Joker. Alhamdulillah, Allah got into Islam. It was one of the best, like, happiest days of my life to see my best friend become Muslim. Alhamdulillah. When he became Muslim, he had a bag of weed in his pocket. So we walked out of the masjid, and he was like, it's like, can I have like one more? I like, don't even say it. <laughs> SubhanAllah, what he did, he went in the restroom, he flushed it. He said, Alhamdulillah, anybody over here. So he married a woman from Morocco, so of course he's very happy. <laughs> he's even not a, not, he's big now, of course. Even that, that Bastila and stuff. But we were talking how to make da'wah to this guy. Da'wah means how to talk to him about selling alcohol, it's not good for the community. So we had another friend named Abu Bakr, also who was a blood before. And we decided to dress up like lips al-Azhari, lips al like the formal dress of religious people, and go to there and buy alcohol from him at like 3 in the morning. So <laughs> we showed up with big turbans, you know, and, and uh, we were like rolling with Sadeq's rocket. <laughs> had a base, a base on our buses. And we pulled up in the store, and then he was like, Imam Saab, Kamana Chin, Baluachi. You know where he's from when I said that. I'm not going to say where he's from, but you know, you know the language. So I got this 24 pack up. It's like, it's like Charlie Murphy's, I got this 24 pack of beer. I'm the imam. It was light though. And I got it. And he was looking at me and he was just like. Mujahid, DJ Joker, had a tesbih and he got porno magazines. So he got these porno magazines, he was trying not to look, it was funny, he was like. African American brother, good brother. And he's like, what's up, folks? He had all the shawakamis. Shawakamis, right? Straight, straight Taliban. Then Abu Bakr, I don't want to say what he got. <coughs> Can't say the masjid. We put it all right there on the cash register. And we made sure there was no one there that would see us, of course. He set up the, the camera, put everything there. And he was like convulsing. <laughs> and I was trying not to laugh. I, I laughed a lot. So we was in the house, or the blue house, or the green house. Anyways, so we we put everything there, and then he was like, Imam, Imam, stop. Right? So then I was like, now what are we supposed to do? Like, okay, we're at the finish line, but someone's got cross. And then Joker said to him, he was like, yo, he said, sorry, he said, excuse me, can I ask you a question? He was like, yeah. Yeah, he said, are you surprised to see us buying this from you? He's like, Imam Saab, Zindigi Bebandigi Shayu. Right, you know? Right? He was flipping out. He started speaking Urdu Bengali, flipped out. And then Leland said to him, he said, the way you feel about us buying it, how we feel when you have this, how we feel when you see us selling it. And he started crying. He said, I'm going to quit. So we do stuff like that. We do a little different. Right? We do things a little different. And then he told me I'm a doctor. I'm like, a medical doctor? Like, what are you selling beer for? I work in hospital, man. CSI or whatever, man. So he, he humbled us. That's what we do with him. And we try to create things like people that don't pray. You know, we say, look, man, how many times a day you check your email? More than five times. Don't tell me you ain't got time to pray. I know people that post on that. Pe the world is ADHD now. It's, it's a fact. We're, we're socially ADHD. Right, so someone will write something on Facebook, how many times they'll check it a minute later? Well, one of us will. People, people, I know someone told me they like 60 times in an hour. And then they tell me, they said that they walked in on Sunday. So, trying to make things relevant, I said in the football, man, you can send tweets to your friends, you can't tweet to Allah with dua. You know, this is not your foundation that you put on your face, this is your foundation, girl. Right. Make things relevant to people. But if we talk about, you know, awratul ama, wa fiqh al ama, wa al fiqh qadim jiddin, la yul tabdak fi hadil ayam, la yul diyu qulub al shabab. So, so the religion has to be relevant to people. So when you talk to them, so in, 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 in college we had like a, a phone line we called Brothers for Fajr. You know, we had like a competition for a month where we place Fajr the most. 
he, he, you know, we have to buy him breakfast, stuff like that. We do things like that, right? Yeah. And then we like never condemn people. We say, man, come on, you know, it's good for you. Look how they advertise junk food. They never say that, you know, Doritos is filled with like chemicals that can turn your head into like three heads, and it's processed food, and the corn is like half. You know, they say Doritos are good for you. you know. 100% real cheese, and uh, you can just go buy some real cheese, but I gotta buy a chip for real cheese. Right? You don't put the chips on the nachos, you put the cheese on the nachos, right? So, but when we talk about religion, how do we talk to people? I was in Egypt one time, 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 تسعمية حادي عشر هجرية مولانا مات قبل فرو مات قبل محمد علي باش بطعنا بعدين سكت عشان يعرف ده الشيخ بجواب ده الشيخ رب الشيخ وطلب أتعرف ناسي أقرأ قال آه أنا بعرف دي مصرية جامدة ودي لبنانية مولانا مش مصرية مش ميموروفية بطعنا سلام وقام الرب الرحيم بعد أود دي ناس أقرم تعرفها؟ أنا أعرفها كما أعرف يدي أو تعرف عمر دياب؟ أوه ده الرمز الشاب مصر أو تنظر إلى عذاب إلى كيف ملت الأمة بعد ذلك تعرف هؤلاء ولا تعرف هذا؟ يمان عبد الرحمن سيوطي هو الآخر الذي حفظ أكثر من مئة حرف عديد بسند إلى سيدنا رسول الله وأنت لا تعرفه؟ إن كان سيوطي أمريكي نرى أمام بيته متحف في سيوت فين سيوتي فين فين قبره فين خوب بتاعه لا أعرف يعني لا أحد يعني so to make it like relevant وللأسف الشديد في سعودية تدمير الأثار الإسلامية تدميرا كاملا شاملا the destruction of Muslim antiquities in Saudi Arabia and other countries is it, how are we going to make Islam relevant to people without seeing their history and history was human it's balanced now we have an idealized Islam because people don't know the history fiqh is a human science so being relevant, you have to be relevant. I asked Jamal Badawi one time, how do you do this as an art? I said, how do you, how do you make da'wah as an art? You have to shoot the Amr Khalid. Give a nasifu, give a nasifu. La, la yusuf. How do I mean, ma'ajad, ma'ashallah. So like these things we are thangya, tafannan bida'wah. But you have to do things like your friends relate to them. You can't just come, eh, usalli, ya, rahimukum Allah. That one fa'ashi. Allahu alayhi wa Yes. Where are you from? Sudan. Sudan. Sudanese people are so nice. They're very friendly people. Like, Mashallah. Yeah. 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 Uh, how, how I entered this now? I read the Quran in English in the restaurant. Yeah, I was scared for my mom. And I couldn't have my and I and lose half a day. So I used to read the Quran, I read the Quran, uh, so I became Muslim. So I was really, really just reading the Quran and, and understand really what I was really terrified of Muslims. Like I was literally scared of Muslims and Arabs in particular. And I asked them. And by love Sudanese even then. So I remember I went to the mosque, this guy who's like taller than me. No one's taller than me. Except Stoudemire. So he comes to me, he's like, Brother, you want to come to my house for the food? <laughs> I don't know what language you speak. Uh, I'm good. I don't, I don't know what language you speak, but I. So I want this big dude, this huge, massive guy, right? And then he breaks out like you know the the makluba, yeah, the shorta, the shai. I look up and I see this big picture of Aksa in his his house, and I was like, oh my God, he's Palestinian. <laughs> I was scared. Like, he's the bloke the building or something. He's a Palestinian. He's the nicest person I have, one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. So just meeting him like shattered all those fears. Then I read the Quran and I was just like, wow, it's very different than you know what I thought it was. And that's how I became Muslim. Yes. Huh? What's your name? Where are you from? Ah no, Sahna. What happened to you? This is gonna be the last question just because the scholars have to show another point. Who's this guy? Oh, yeah, not me. <laughs> 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 
I'm not, no, I'm not. I'm saying don't call me. I'm taking my own. What was the difference when I read the Quran in English and when I read the Quran in Arabic? Yeah, I mean, like I said, it's like watching TV in black and white, watching Blu-rays or via, you know, VCR or Beta, if you remember what Beta was. It's like PS3 compared to an Atari, like Pong, like Space Invaders compared to like, you know, I'm not going to say, the Creed, huh? <laughs> huh? Yeah? No, I memorized the Quran first. Well, I didn't trust the Arabic. Huna, Mushina, Taum, Lahan. Those are the Lahjib Taum, man. So here, actually, the way that we studied, and I don't advise people to do this, but the way I initially studied was all memorization. يعني وما بيتا وأدي في الجمعة يكسروا في الجر وفي نصبي كما أن ألفية و. So, but that that way of language is good, but it creates an engineer of the language. It doesn't create an artist of the language. So memorizing all these classical texts was great. I loved it. I'm very thankful. But uh, I learned the sweetness of the language actually through slang, through Amina, Nasriya. Because Amina, you express yourself more, right? You say like, like what's in your heart. More. So that's how. But it's, it's complete. I would say that the fundamental meaning is there. But uh, it's like it's like you have the shy bidun halawiyat. Uh, we have Um Ali. Mashkur, Black Malakhans. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, for those of you who are from the Emirates, uh, Imam Sahib Web does have a website that's sahibweb.com. So if you want to keep in touch with him or be, you know, more, uh, have more access to his lectures and articles he writes. I think, blog that's posted I think they know what it is. So hey, <laughs> web.com. Um, and for the rest of you who are here who are not in the Emirates or from New York, uh, Sheikh Sahib Web is going to be here all weekend. Uh, the conference starts tonight. We have, we have. Sahibweb.com has an Emirati writer if you want to have a deeper nationalistic connection to Sahibweb.com. <laughs> um, the conference is going to start tonight. Uh, the first session starts at 6.30. Um, and it'll go till 10.30, and tomorrow is from 9 a.m. till 10 p.m., and there's still tickets available. It's in the Skirball Center, so definitely come by if you haven't gotten a ticket. Uh, Sheikh Soheb is going to be speaking on panels throughout the day, and he's going to be speaking on a panel tonight as well, and there's going to be a lot of other speakers also who are around. Now, last quick announcement. We're going to try to do the bone marrow drive at the conference tomorrow, but we're going to need volunteers to do the swabbing. So if you're coming to the conference and you can spend some time at that table helping to collect samples for the bone marrow drive, again, it's for a three-year-old child uh, whose name is Rayan, who's in dire need of this, this transplant. Um, and you have an interest in helping to facilitate the drive, to see the people who are at the table, because they can train you on how to do it really quickly. If we get enough volunteers, then we'll be able to host it tomorrow. We're expecting about... 500 to 700 people at the conference, so it'll be a really good opportunity for us to collect more samples. So, if you guys have a few minutes to spare and are willing to volunteer some time tomorrow, that'd be great. Because I feel like there's only